So we just saw some of the patterns in the work of other architects who might have been influential for Frank Lloyd Wright. And now we're diving into the work of Wright. So what are the projects that uh, you find similar and, and some, if you can show us some examples of where this is happening? Right. So there's a particular pattern that we'll look at. Wright has several, but we'll look at uh, one in particular. So we'll start with the uh, Larkin Building in Buffalo, New York. And we looked at that before, and we see that there are two parts to the building. There's uh, the main part, a service part where the lockers are, fire stairs, and the entrances in between. And then the main part has balconies going around uh, and a space all the way up to a skylight in the center. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, here we are in plan, and we have our main uh, section of the building, subsidiary section, and entrance in between. Balconies running around and skylight in the center, and then some hollow tubes dropping through the building with stairs, mechanical, etc. So then let's look at around the same time, just a few years later, uh, Unity Temple in Oak Park. So this is a Unitarian church right near Frank Lloyd Wright's own home. And what do we have? We have a major space, a minor space, entrance in between. The major space has balconies running around and a skylight in the middle. So this quite different looking building, uh, Larkin is in brick, this is in concrete, um, and, uh, but really the exact same pattern. So major space, minor space, major space, minor space. That's pretty big over there, but that's the kindergarten. So that's yeah. the minor space. Entrance in between, and then you come in, uh, hollow tubes with mechanical running through them. Air is coming up from the basement, and a balcony's running around, and a skylight in the middle. Maybe that should sound familiar. <laughs> so, uh, but before we, uh, let's do one more. And this is Johnson Wax. So, uh, in order to make our point, we're going to not look at this part of the building. So just this part. This was built in uh, 1936. This was built in 1950, much later edition. So let's look at the original part. And we got a major space, minor space, entrance in between. Then we've got balconies running around and skylights in the middle and hollow tubes dropping through with elevator shafts and air shafts and stuff like that. So here we can see the balcony running around. A uh, band of window above, because he wants to tell you this wall is not holding up the roof. Uh, that's a you know, key point. Uh, uh, architects want to be clear about this. We're not using bearing walls. We're using columns. Cur Corbusier makes that point. And then we have columns here and skylights above. So, major space, major space, minor space, minor space. Entrance in between, balcony running around, skylights in the middle, hollow tubes dropping through. And so, here we've got um, a very simple pattern which Wright finds extremely useful. And he's able to use it in these quite different buildings. One's a church, one's an office building, and the others of a different kind of office building. So, is there a pattern in your work? Also, think about who are the artists in any field. Think of Beethoven. Think of Mozart. Um, think of musicians that you um, that you appreciate. Uh, Elvis Presley's first recordings are called the Sun Recordings. So that's what he did for uh, at Sun Records, and. Um, uh, it's, they've been released as an album, so you can get the Sun recordings. And that's the first thing he did. It lays out everything he's going to do. It's all there in that original work. Mm. So think of various artists that you uh, appreciate and then start thinking about that. And then think about your own work. And of course, there's something a little make you nervous here. Get it, you got to get it right in the beginning. <laughs> You don't want to be struggling with something that doesn't work later in your career. Mm. And we, we can see this also in the Guggenheim, which you just uh, showed recently. Right. 
you know, major and minor space entrance in between. But what about the houses and some other projects? We'll see one coming up. Or other than these uh, kind of uh, big public buildings, like uh, what other patterns he yeah. has other than the major and minor space? Is there well, anything in the shafts? And we'll look at this. We'll look at this pattern in two more buildings. Uh, the Guggenheim and the Martin House in our next lecture. And then the other pattern would be this kind of shaft-like center for his high-rise buildings, hmm. which we saw uh, uh, last hmm. week. Right. And uh, so we have the shaft-like center, and then cantilevering out from that are the floors. Tree-like structure, right? Right. Which we can see a little bit in the mushroom columns, too, in the Johnson Max. Correct. And in the tower, obviously. Right. Well, the, the Johnson Tower is the archetypal example of that, and then mm. we get a variant on it in the uh, Price Tower. Does he break the pattern at some point? In well, some he'll projects? vary it. So the, the um, Johnson Wax, we, we have an actual solid shaft in uh, Price Tower, there are four fins that are sort of coming and sort of together make a mm. sort of shaft. So. And we saw a house with this hex hexagonal plan, the, uh, the three hexagon, whatever. A you trihex call it. grid, right. Trihex there are grid. a half a dozen of those. And Which is totally different, obviously. Right, yes. right. But th 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 that trihex grid is, is another pattern which he uses for quite a few houses. And, and we saw it also in, uh, in the plan of the towers that he designed for St. Mike Place here in New York, right? Right. The same triangular grid. Right, right. Thank you. So what do we have next? So we're going to look at a couple of more um, of these, a um, couple more buildings where we're going to see the same pattern.